Good morning and happy Sabbath, June 4th, 2022. We are very excited to be studying today. Amen. Uh, something that uh, I will be preaching on in the future. Maybe not so as close to the future as I had anticipated in this next sermon series. I might be saving uh, this topic of Jacob because um, my sermon title is going to be similar in terms of Jacob to Israel. I might be pushing it off a little bit since we're studying this today. But uh, I'm excited about going through this with Kyle. He, of course, will be doing the play-by-play, -play, and I'll be doing the color commentary. And uh, we are glad that you are here with us in the sanctuary. And uh, thank you to Dean, who has stepped up and was here early, my wife, who stepped up. And I think my wife and I had a record of coming to church at the same time. <laughs> Uh, this early in the morning, <laughs> not this early, but earlier. And uh, we want to say a special prayer for a couple of our brothers, um, a, a big, big time one for Richard Castle, um, who had to go to the emergency room last night. He is home. He is better. Uh, he had an extremely high heart rate and blood pressure, and it looks like he is getting the help for that. Um, but he is, uh, uh, he is home resting, which. The Sabbath gives us an opportunity to do that physical rest. So our Amen. prayers are with Amen. Richard Castle as he bounces back. And our brother Smith, who just graduated, and Angel Stadium, what a beautiful place oh, really? I to didn't graduate. Know there, yeah. I, I just want to let you know, in coming to meet you, I accidentally drove past his graduation and saw his classmates and maybe him in the parking lot, so I was kind of <laughs> at his graduation. Oh, there you go. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so we're praying for Smith and hoping... He Amen. feels yes. uh, better uh, soon as well. So we are going to dive right in. I'm going to turn it over to Kyle, and uh, we are ready to jump into our study this week. You want to open with prayer? Absolutely. Thank you for the reminder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Kyle is helping me stay on track as uh, uh, he, un he understood my sleep schedule this week and uh, all of the, the graduation stuff going on. Let us bow our heads for a word of opening prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your presence in our lives. We are so grateful for your presence in the life of uh, people like Joseph, who we're going to be talking about at 11 o'clock, and uh, your servant Jacob, who we're talking about right now, a individual whose very act of faith and resilience led to the naming of an entire generation and group of people. So, Heavenly Father, we ask that you help us today as we study, as we read your word, that we too will have that spirit of faithfulness and resilience in, in the face of adversity and challenges that life brings. We thank you for hearing our prayer. We thank you for spending this time with us as we sit at your feet and learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. And good to have our guest with us uh, this morning and uh, my beautiful wife, uh, along with Roseanne and Clarita and others will be joining. Uh, Kyle, you can start us with Jacob Israel. Yes, yeah, so that's the title of this uh, lesson, that one that's very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was quite an interesting lesson. You know, it, it's strange how sometimes you go back and read things and you don't realize things you've missed or yeah. things you might have forgotten or just didn't realize, you know. So that's always a blessing, I think, with these. Yeah. Um, but it's also a kind of a, a very strange bunch of stories because it's not just a single, <laughs> a single story. Um, but some of the things that happened with him, it just, it's uh, quite fascinating. I recommend you read. We won't be able to read all the uh, verses, so they're listed in the quarterly if you want to uh, take and uh, look those up and read them for yourself later. But I definitely recommend them. They're very interesting stories that are uh, quite important. So... Before we get into the lesson itself, I was just thinking about this title, which is Jacob, Israel. And it's one of those things where those are names. And in this lesson, we read a lot about names. Names have so much <laughs> uh, meaning and value, especially, it seems like back then. I mean, there's still names now, but people don't use yes. it in the same way. Yes. I mean, everything they did there in, the, <laughs> in those verses you're reading is... <laughs> They named this place for this and this reason yes. and they named it, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah you had, and in our sermon, we're going to be talking about that too, if that gets mentioned. Yes, and so names have, you know, great meaning and power. Obviously, yes. we know we call them the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not the name in itself like some magic word yes. that necessarily has power. It's the, the meaning of it 
And, you know, I was thinking about names then, and names can, they can define things, you, they can be enlightening, damaging, you know, they can uh, separate us, they can condemn us, and they can uplift us. Yeah. Names have uh, power, and really, names are just words, or maybe a better way to put it is words are names. If you think about yeah. most of the words we use for anything in life, so true. it's basically a name. Yeah. You know, this table, you know, that's a name for this table, and it means things to us. When we say table, it actually means more than just those letters spelled out as table. That's right. And then it takes on different meaning for the Christian. The mm -hmm. table means a huge thing. <laughs> yeah. And so words are basically names. And so everything we do in life yeah. is us defining and using names That's right. in some fashion. That's right. And in thinking about that, it made me realize that you know, those names are, and words are a very powerful thing. Obviously, you know, we've heard things like Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names, you know, words can never hurt me or names can never hurt me, depending on who says it. Which, yeah, which is... Uh, Horribly wrong, but... <laughs> easier, easier said than done. Yes. And, and it's amazing that God understands that. And so here, you know, takes a name supplanter and is going to do something about that, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to go around in your life, um, you know, just, I, I've listened to some names that people have and I'm just like, wow, or nicknames that people have. <laughs> You know, and, and like, ooh, they got stuck with that nickname? Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the whole life they have that. And uh, you get to a certain age where you can say, you know what, I think I'm going to change that. But here in this situation, God says, you know what, I'm going to change that. Mm -hmm, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and I truly believe when we get to heaven, there, there's an opportunity for us to have a name that uh, is, goes deeper even than our, than our own that we yes, have now. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. And I think everything we have, I mean, one of the first tasks that Adam was set out with when he yeah, was created so, oh, it's such a big deal. was to name the animals. Yeah. The, you know, what yeah. do you call these things? What do you define it as? That's right. And uh, you know, that's, it's such an important thing, that name and that word power. And in the New Testament, New Testament, it carries on the tradition where it was a huge thing when Joseph names Jesus. He's told what to name mm -hmm. him, but the mm -hmm. fact that he names him is the father claiming a child as his own. And so he's basically saying he's heaven born, but I am his earthly father. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge deal. It's not just, again, a Wikipedia. Oh, by the way, he gave, he gave him a name. The fact that Joseph names him right, right. Uh, puts David, uh, he puts um, Jesus in the lineage of David and all that lineage that goes through Matthew 1. So naming is, you're absolutely right, is huge throughout Scripture. And then, of course, you've heard things like the pen is mightier than the sword, right? Oh, you've heard yes. that one, which basically means, again, written word. You know, again, those words, those names, they have such yeah. power. That's right. And then I was thinking the fact that the Bible compares our tongue to a sword, a, a double-edged sword, really, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. And it just shows the power that words do have. And so I think one of the things I took away from this lesson was realizing that we really need to watch what we say, what we do have much more consequence to their meaning than just, you know, flippantly saying something out and thinking, you know, well, this is, it's just words. It's just yeah, how I Yeah, that's a popular like notion it. this day. Like, oh, I didn't really mean it. I just said it. You know? Yes. <laughs> we just saw where it cost somebody $15 million. Uh, words do evidently still hold some <laughs> weight, maybe not on social media, but in the legal courts, words actually do very much matter. Yeah. And well, think that, about that. $15 yes. million dollars for the use of words. Oh, well, even <laughs> copyright stuff goes yeah. in it, you know? I mean, yeah. there's just, yeah. It's amazing. amazing how much words have value. Yeah. And the very fact of how God created this world, he, you know, he spoke it into existence. Words, naming, became, you know, in essence, our creation. It's, oh, yeah. And so it's yeah. so important, again, to realize that God's very word for us, when he talks to you, it, it does, it's not just him babbling stuff to you. This has meaning beyond even just the words he gives. Right. There's, there's deeper meaning to everything that God does for us. That's right. So let's go ahead and read the memory text. Okay, I'll, I'll see read if I can that. put that up. All right, it's found in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28, and it says, your, And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Do you want uh, me to read any of the intro there? Yeah, let's go ahead and just read okay. the opening okay. week's lesson there. The family sa saga of Jacob continues, both the good and the bad. And it, boy, it just keeps on continuing as, as it goes. <laughs> Yet through it all, the hand of God and his faithfulness to the covenant promises are revealed. Mm -hmm. So we'll see not only the Bible study 
this morning, but in the sermon as well. This week follows more of Jacob. Now that he had left Laban and returned, turning home, had to face Esau, the victim of Jacob's treachery. What would his brother, so grievously wrong, now do to him? Fortunately for Jacob, amid the fear of what was coming, the Lord God of his fathers appeared again to him in an incident that was a precursor to what later we known as the time of Jacob's trouble. See Jeremiah 30, 5 through 7. And that night, Jacob, the supplanter, became Israel, a new name for a new beginning, a beginning that would ultimately lead to the creation of a nation itself named after him. Can you imagine that? A whole nation of people <laughs> being named after you for an act I'm not sure I want people to name that. Yeah, I, I get that. A lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. In other words, despite all that happens, the story of the patriarchs and their family is told in Scripture, good morning, Roger, in order to show us that God is faithful to fulfill what he has promised and that he will do so despite what at times seems to be nothing but his people doing all that they can to stop that fulfillment, which is what we've been talking about in the sermon yes, series as yes, well. Yes. Like people keep messing up and God just keeps delivering oh, on his promises they do don't they yeah it's just really i don't know we do have such a merciful god honestly when yeah. reading this lesson you, you can't help but take away the fact that we really mess up a lot <laughs> and he is and he doesn't like just work around like through wind and water like he he uses those very people you know he uses mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. very people he uses jacob and then in my sermon today he uses you know joseph you know who uh, is an offspring of all of this. You yes, know? yes. I want to read this uh, one Ellen G. White quote here that I okay. thought was just really good. If you would read it for me, that would yeah, be good. Yeah, where do you want me to start? I'll pull it up here. It is a marvel. It is a marvel to me that God will bear with the perversity of the children of men so long, bearing with their disobedience and yet suffering them to live, abusing <laughs> his mercies, bearing false witness against him, in most wicked statements, but God's ways are not as our ways, and we will not marvel at his loving forbiddance and tender pity and infinite compassion, for he has given an unmistakable evidence that this is just like his character, slow to anger, mm. showing mercy unto thousands of those who love him and keep his commandments. The obligations resting upon us are not small. Our sense of dependence will drive us closer to God, and our sense of duty to be performed will summon us to effort. Combined with our earnest prayer, works, faith, and continual prayer, power, power. Our great cry is for power without measure. It awaits us. We have only to draw, to take God at his word, to act faith. I love it. Mm -hmm. To stand firmly upon the promises, to wrestle for the endowment of the mm -hmm. grace of God. I love that. Learning is not essential. Genius is not necessary. Mm -hmm. Eloquence may be lacking, but the prayer of the lowly and contrite heart god hears and when he hears no obstacles on earth can hinder and when he hears sorry no obstacles on earth can hinder the power of god will make us effectual this day with god page 187 and and if you're uh, here visiting with us here in the sanctuary um uh just to to let you know we as seventh day adventist christians believe in the sola scriptura Amen. the bible and the bible alone this is our creed but uh in the founding and of this great advent movement there has been some people with tremendous gifts and one of them was uh his daughter who just wrote this and i'm gonna get to go see her home the last home mm -hmm. she lived in in elmshaven my wife and i are going um sabbath june 25th uh to puc church up in angwin and then you see my old dorm and then we're going to uh, ellen white's last home and you talk about power through feebleness Mm -hmm. Here was an imperfect, some people talk about her and put her on this pedestal. She, she was an imperfect mm -hmm. person, small, frail, uh, se serious head injury when she was nine. Um, and yet, uh, still to this day, down in San Diego, my hometown, uh, she had been led that there was water in this one location. The Spirit showed her, still to this day, Paradise Valley uh, Hospital Properties uses that water to... to um, um, water their land. But on top of that, that small, frail, at young age, injured woman when she was in her 70s was still preaching from her diaphragm and speaking to crowds of hundreds. Um, so it, it, talk about feebleness and power coming together and the strength of God. Uh, Jacob was not the only one hobbled mm -hmm. uh, who was still powerfully used by God throughout history. Exactly. God can use anyone. Absolutely. And, you know, we need to remember that. Absolutely. But I love that, that 
the, the emphasis is on the power of God, yes. you know, and, and uh, I might be sending you a slide a little bit, a little bit later but, uh, <laughs> that, that didn't make it in quite yet, okay. but this word that I heard this week was pipeline, like when you go to the, go, I like pipeline because we're here in California and you have the, the, the surf, the waves, and you think about that wave that curls and you just ride, if you, that wave can destroy you if you hit it wrong. If you hit that wave just right, you're in that groove where you're just riding that mm -hmm, power. Mm -hmm. as, and and that's, that's really what it's like when you're in harmony with the Spirit of God. And uh, just, it's, the power doesn't come from you. You just align your sails, align your surfboard. Um, if you're in Simon Peter School of Surf, align your bare feet. <laughs> and you just go with where God takes you. And mm -hmm. so you align yourself with, with God's purposes. And that's where we become part of that pipeline or that vessel to, to the power of God. That's so amazing how often we try to fight what God wants to do. Yeah. You know, it's like turning in that pipe and just trying to go your own way. You know, God has set life on a path, yep. and yet we don't want to trust him to lead. And yeah, <laughs> and at the same time, I do like that Jacob here isn't just... Jacob, the, the, when I preach on Jacob in the future, I'm going to include one New Testament passage where the woman who Jesus says, I don't give what is holy to the dogs, and she says, um, wait, this conversation's not over, right, and she right. just keeps going. We sometimes think we just show up to God, ask for something, and then walk away. Like we're, there's no dialogue, there's no conversation. Right. Something going on in the Old Testament and the New, but in the Old Testament was this was the time of bartering. You go back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, the Lord says this, and you say, but Lord, if there's 50 people, you know, there's this back and forth. And nowadays, too many uh, professed followers of Christ just like... You know, yes, there's ultimately a thy will be done, but there's an interchange. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love Jacob the wrestler, um, who becomes, that name becomes so powerful, much more than supplanter, and becomes the name of an entire people. And, and imagine if we all were willing to what she says here, Ellen says, wrestle with God. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and the faithfulness is not just all hunky-dory and bumper stickers, and <laughs> I just never have my problems, never have my doubts. It's hanging with God and holding on to God and wrestling with God and receiving those blessings. Well, there's, you know, definitely we need to live in the moment. God created us to Absolutely. live. He didn't create us to just follow in His designed for everything. I mean, if he wanted that, he could have just that made us robots and put That's us right. on the path to wherever we're supposed to go, you know, like a little video game where we just kind of all do our own thing the way we're meant to, That's the way right. the programmer designed. And one of the most powerful people that influenced me when I first became a Christian, on Sunday mornings I'd wake up, and uh, when I first became an Adventist, George Vandeman was on Sunday mornings on uh, It Is Written, and when he, because I was trying to pray thee and thou and thine, <laughs> and you know, like the King James, mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that if, if it's, you know, if that's what speaks to our hearts the most, but George helped me by saying, you know, when you talk to God, you can talk to him as you're talking to a friend. Now, it's a high and holy friend. I never <laughs> let myself forget that. At the same time, George Vanderman shared some times where he was upset and struggled with God and asked why and, and had his fist clenched, and oh, mm -hmm. wow, that's, just, that's not very polite, but how many times in relationships do we try to be polite and not get to the heart of the matter? Yes. And sometimes yes. you need to get to the heart of the matter and get the itch issue resolved. And mm -hmm. that's what I love about yeah. Jacob is, yeah, he could have just said, okay, I, I lose, whatever, but will not let go until he goes deeper in the relationship and gets the blessing. Exactly. So let's go ahead and talk about that uh, yeah. particular story, and yeah. that is wrestling with God for Sunday's lesson. And so I'm going to pull this up so we can read the uh, question one that they put here. I thought that was pretty good. Yep. And if you could read this, I'll read the question. If you can read the Bible verses when I pull okay. up. Read Genesis 32, 22 through 31, and Hosea 12, 3 and 4. What okay. is the spiritual significance of this amazing story? Okay, so now he arose. This is Genesis 32, 22 through 31, and Kyle knows I like the New King James. <laughs> No special thing except it was my first Bible I ever had. I would tell that in children's story today. Genesis 32, 22 to 31. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. 
Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, notice the H is capital and the other H is not. So we're talking here about uh, God and Jacob. He touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he, Jacob, said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. <laughs> so he said to, name, said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. I just want to pause right there. Most of us, uh, let me go. Okay, it's, hey, it's obviously someone more powerful. It's obviously God. Okay, I'm just going to do. And he will not. There's a back and forth here that's so common in the mm -hmm, New Test Old mm -hmm. Testament. So, um, and he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Mm -hmm. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. <laughs> Just as he rose over Penuel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. So there's a scar there, but there's a blessing that comes from the scar. Mm -hmm. I'm even talking about Joseph, um, and, and this question is going to rise, but here's a different version. What if the places of our injury, our woundedness, are actual the places of some of our deepest, best blessings? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. not because God, like, oh, I'm going to torture Kyle, torture Pastor Darren, but it just, he's going to take... He's going to take the things that are in this life, the recipes, and he's going to infuse them with his spirit and his blessing to where we look and we say, wow, I'm not so sure I would have had as deep an understanding had God not allowed me to go through that. Right. Hosea chapter 12, verse 3 and 4. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, talking about Jacob, and his strength he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spoke to us. So I love that there's a sense of prevailing, mm -hmm. like, like um, not becoming better than God, but not giving up in this struggle. And that's why when I do preach on Jacob, I'm going to tie it to that New Testament woman who's not just, good. this is Jesus, this is Messiah, this is, and she's not going to just take the word and say, okay, I'm a dog, I'm going to go away. <laughs> she says, no, even the dogs. And it's almost like Listen, Jesus doesn't want to be put to the test like Lucifer does. If you're the son of God, like, quest, like a deep doubting questioning of the calling that Jesus is. That's a different type of questioning. Right. But the, I think the type of thing that God loves, the type of dialogue is, God, I know who you are. And I, I've seen your work in the word. I've seen your promises. I've read your promises. And I know that this looks like this, but I'm trusting in you that this is what your character is mm -hmm. and this is how you're going to show up in the situation. Not to try to manipulate and show God, but, but to have that dialogue of we have a deep understanding of who he is. And so often when Jesus saw this, he marvels. He marvels at the woman's faith. The Roman who basically like, no, I don't need to do that. You just tell me, you just tell me what to do. You just say the word and there'll be a blessing. It's, it's like God loves to be trusted in a deeper, deeper way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, this story is just uh, really fascinating to me. I, you know, it's always interesting. And there's so many aspects to it because you think, well, you know, obviously as God, you know that he could have easily won the, <laughs> the mm -hmm. battle. And so the mm -hmm. things that are going on here, there's, it's so deep and uh, interesting. And uh, I want to go into a little bit of this. Obviously, we, this is also talking about... Uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, as it's often referred to. Yeah, and I do want to say before we go into that, that Jacob was very courageous and brave, and this might tie in with the Jacob's trouble, because there, the, the myths in that day was that any time you could wrestle, and the word for wrestle is to kick the mud up. So this is a scrap. This isn't just like, okay, tag, you're it. This is, <laughs> they're kicking the mud up, all right? Um, you would say the fur flies, okay, <laughs> nowadays. Um, but there was a myth in back in the day that was just widely accepted that there were ri river demons that yes. would be in existence and would wrestle with human beings. And so Jacob was very brave in engaging with this and being there long enough to understand this was no myth, this was no um, legend uh, in a bad way. This was 
the living God. Yes. And so very courageous in doing that. And then, and then dealing with God saying, I'm going to have faith and hold on that, that you're going to bless me. So now we could talk about, yeah, the, the time of Jacob's trouble. Yes. And uh, one of the things that's interesting with this story is it really has kind of uh, two, two main causes going on here, two distresses that are causing him problems. There's this connection with God that is having troubles at times, he's struggling with. And then, there, of course, there's trouble, his troubles with men, his brother mm -hmm. in particular. Yeah. And so the, there's these, this relationship between the two. You know, he needs to get right with God so that he can get right with his brother, but he needs to get right with his brother also so that he can get right with God. That's right. And so I want to put this up. I, thought, I found this in the teacher's um, comments. And so often people want to choose one and forget <laughs> the other, and it just oh, yeah. doesn't, oh, it doesn't it's, work. Is yeah, it? It's so easy, though, because you think, you know, if I, if I love God, if I'm just doing whatever God wants, then I'm yeah. probably treating everyone else right. Yeah, mm, Depends maybe. how you're looking at that. If you're really following God, yes. But if you're doing following God for your own selfish <laughs> yeah. desires, so look at, look at how wonderful I am. Or to stay in your own <laughs> holy <laughs> comfort just look zone. At, we're safe yeah. here. This is all good. Yeah, yeah. 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 no, no, no. And that's why it's so important over and over again. It talks about Jesus growing a stature with God and with men. And with men, yeah. yes, yeah. definitely. So uh, if you could read this yep. uh, section here, this was, like I said, in the teacher's comments. Okay. Uh, as his grandfather? Yes. As his grandfather Abraham did, Jacob implores God for help. Jacob directs his plea to God alone, for it is God who commanded that he should return to Canaan, Genesis 32, 9. The same God who promised to ensure his posterity, Genesis 32, 12. Jacob refers to the wonder of God's grace, Genesis 32, 10. The two Hebrew words, kest, mercy, and Emmet, truth, are the very words that Abraham's servants used when he blessed God for having heard his prayer. Genesis 24, 7, Genesis 24, 27. After praying, Jacob then camps for the night. However, before retiring, Jacob acts again. Thus, the text moved back and forth between mm -hmm. prayer and action. Because like Jacob, that. yeah, I do too. Most people just like prayer is just, I'm just going to throw up words. If you're not acting on behalf, how much do you really believe in the thing that you just prayed for? Um, because Jacob is not naive and his faith does not make him passive. I like that too. He secures his camp. Jacob or organizes wave after wave of gifts. There's that wave again that we're talking <laughs> about. To be delivered to Esau to appease him, Genesis 32, 20. The Hebrew word kipper for appease means to atone. The association with such w other words as minka, present, are word referring to the offering Leviticus 2, 1 through 14, and nasapanim, forgive or accept, attests to a religious perspective. Jacob has in mind his past reconciliation with God, Genesis 32, 22 to 32, as he attempts to reconcile himself with his brother. Compare Matthew 5, 23. So I thought that was uh, just really well put out. I like how they brought in the Hebrew meanings yes. of those words because it shows the connection between our ability to forgive others yes. comes from our ability to realize we have been forgiven by God, that we have the same, you know, the, yeah. how God has forgiven us is how we are to forgive others. We're in a whole atmosphere of grace. Yes. And that's why Jesus says if you do not forgive the sin, Jesus has not given us a checklist of <laughs> salvation by works. He's saying you're, you're, when you're stepping into me, you're stepping into a whole realm of grace. Mm -hmm. So lack of forgiveness is foreign. It doesn't exist in this land. Um, you step into this land, there's this wave that comes for you, and there's this wave that comes from you, and it's grace. Yes, so. yes. And I want to continue reading with a little bit of this, because they really uh, worded it better than I can probably describe it. So, mm -hmm. um, let me Wrestling get, with God. Uh, let me get down to it here. You're fine. There we go, the information. The information that this man, God, did not prevail contains an important theological lesson about God and his relationship with humans. That's I from, love this. That's yeah. from the, the verse where it's saying that you know, they wrestled all night and God did not prevail. Now, obviously, God could have easily oh, prevailed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God's weakness in his confrontation with humans is an expression of his grace and love and of the mercy, mystery of his incarnation to save humans. I love it. Mm -hmm. The impression of, the, I love it, the impression of weakness is immediately contradicted by the man's next move, <laughs> a simple touch. I mean, if he can touch and dislocate a hip, he probably could have taken him down with a full Nelson or a, Just you know, blown him out of there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, suggesting a superhuman power. The place of the blow, the socket of Jacob's hip, Genesis 32, 25, which refers to the loin or the thigh, is a euphemism 
for the place associated with procreation. Interesting. Mm -hmm. The divine touch is thus an implicit blessing pointed to Jacob's descendants, Genesis 46, 26, and Exodus 1, 5. That Jacob was hit as at the organ generator of life also has been linked to the dietary prohibition, prohibition against eating blood. For life is in the blood, Genesis 9, 4. The practice is, therefore, a mere reminder of the story of Jacob. It, is also recall, it also recalls that biblical episode and with it, its theological lessons. It also draws the meat eaters' attention to the fundamental principles of the sacredness of life. Just, uh, yeah, really powerful stuff there. there. There is just so much to that story and things you, didn't, you don't think of sometimes when reading it. You, know, you, the, you can focus so much on one part of it that you, you miss right. other things. There's just and so just, much in it. There's echoes of Jesus' words. And he's exactly. told, don't you know we could take your life? And he's like, uh, sort of paraphrasing, don't you know? <laughs> Nobody takes my life except I lay it down. Like this is a, this is a, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to remember the right word. This is a voluntary subjugation. Mm -hmm. This is a temporary, voluntary subjugation in order for the rescue plan of humanity to uh, be signed, sealed, and delivered by the living God. Yes. And one more paragraph here, because yep. this is really important too, because it also talks about uh, what we read in the Bible verse there of Hosea. The prophet Hosea interprets Jacob's struggle with God as an experience of prayer. I like Hosea. that experience of prayer part. You know, we, yeah. we often, you know, we think of saying a prayer. No, it's an experience. That's right. I love it. It's not a checklist, did that, you know, said my things. And Hosea <laughs> I covered all the words. Four. No. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and I love where Paul talks about praying without ceasing. So this is a constant mm -hmm. thing throughout the day. It is Jacob's faith that explains his tenacious, I love the word tenacious, his tenacious insistence, Luke 11, 5 through 8. Thus, Jacob's new name is Israel. The explanation, I got to look up Luke 11, 5 through 8 a little bit later. The explanation of the man, <laughs> don't do it now. Okay, okay. <laughs> the explanation of the man introduces a number of paradoxes. Jacob has wrestled with God, and yet the man explains that Jacob also wrestled with men. The name Israel literally means God fights, although this explanation affirms that it is Jacob who fights. Jacob has just been hit by the man who dislocated his hip, and yet the narrative explains that it is Jacob who prevailed. All of these paradoxes convey important theological lessons. Number one, the quality of number one, the quality of Jacob's relationship with God depends on the quality of his relationship with men. In this instance, Esau, and vice versa. Number two, the name Israel, God fights reminds Jacob that he must learn to let God fight for him. I love mm -hmm. that. Exodus 14, 13 to 14. Jacob will prevail insofar as he will allow God to prevail over him, yes. a principle that will be enunciated by Paul. When I am weak, then I am strong, 2 Corinthians 12, 10. It's also echoed in the final quote I want to read um, uh, from the pen of inspiration at the end on Friday. Jacob calls the place where God has appeared to him, Peniel, which means the face of God. The same name signifies Jacob's personal experience, confronted by God and survived. The use of the Hebrew expression face-to-face -face, does not mean that Jacob actually saw the physical face of God. This expression is equivalent to seeing the form of the Lord, Numbers 12, 8, and describes rather the experience of a direct encounter with God, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 4. I'm going to let you talk a little while yes. while I look at this, Luke. <laughs> yes, and... So again, what we see here is just such an important thing of our relationship to God and man, and also our reliance on God. You know, it's so easy to get into this mode that, you know, when you're, you're praying and asking God for help, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I got help, and I'm doing this. It's, I'm doing this. Mm. Uh, my faith increased here, and you know, look at all this wonderful stuff I'm doing because of God. Yes, God's wonderful, but look at what I'm able to do my because of faith, God. yeah. And when, instead, it says right there, it's like, this all comes from God. You know, it has to start from God. The overcoming doesn't come because of something we earn from God. You know, like, well, if I'm good enough, God's going to help me overcome this, <laughs> these problems. In his sermon, you'll hopefully get a chance to see that Joseph seems to be a, a little lighter, kinder version, uh, a chip off the old block. <laughs> but he basically, Joseph, is, Joseph gets it all the way in yes. terms of, uh, this comes from God. This comes from God. This comes from God. So it, that's an amazing thing, too, because he gets touched in the hip, and that was mm -hmm. a wonderful reminder there. 
And so Jacob's offspring, actually with his hanging on and his faithfulness, this is something we don't think about too often. How much sometimes we're just hanging on can it actually create a space of faith that our children and our grandchildren can dive in even deeper. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and instead of, you know, we've seen families fall sin after sin after sin, generation <laughs> after generation after generation. I recently saw a man get out of his car with a pin, 35-year-old man with a baseball cap, and I was like, oh, he's, he's fixing a sign. No, he was tagging, and I was like, uh, I, isn't that something 15-year-olds do? 16-year-olds? <laughs> nope, 35 years old, still tagging. Wanted to make sure everybody, and then jumps in his, his family sedan. <laughs> and he saw me look back as I was at the ATM. He saw me look back. And so I walked over just to see, because I literally thought he was fixing a poster. And I saw he was tagging. And he not only, he got in his car and went around the corner to watch, to see if I would erase what he did, because he saw me look. Mm. And I was just like, in my mind, I was like, you're 35, man. And... Um, <laughs> But we could pass that kind of lack of faith and that silliness onto our kids. The opposite is true. Yes. Here, Jacob has so many problems, tries to manipulate. His mom helps him manipulate. <laughs> but the faith that he has and the blessing he receives, and now you just see Joseph just a life of faith that we've seen two weeks in a row. We're going to see a third day. So listen, sometimes we look at our track record and just say, man, there's, oh, it's been so bad, it's been such a bad example. <laughs> okay, we'll take that one little faith, that opportunity today to live a life mm -hmm. of faith because that could be the thing that your kids get. That could be the thing that your grandkids or the kids you mentor get from your life. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. and just go with that. Well, it's interesting. When I think back to some of the you know, people that have uh, influenced my life and such, sometimes it's not the, the wonderful things that they did it's the things they overcame that oh, yeah. you know provided so much yeah. you know importance and yeah. uh, boost to my life and my faith. Yeah. You know, it, it's easy to say if everything's going well, you know, oh, this person told me to be good and everything, life is wonderful, you know, and that yeah. life, everything would be great. You know, that, that's fine, you know. But it's another if a person says, Look, I messed up, I have done horrible and look what God brought me through. Yeah, yeah that changes my, changes how you feel. I think of my grandpa. My grandpa was not a perfect man. He sometimes hit the bottle. He, he had his issues. Um, uh, was a rascal, to say the least. <laughs> um, but I look at his childhood, seven years old. His dad walked out when he was two, I think. Came back time, to, but he was, his dad was more like a big kid. Mm -hmm. um, his mom dies of lockjaw at seven. He, he, his, he's raised by his oldest sister, who's 13. They have to r ride on rail cars mm -hmm. during the Great Depression to survive, you know, or, or just before the Great Depression to survive, um, hammering spikes in railroads at the age of 10 and had to hide. He had Native American in him and tried to hide that <laughs> aspect of himself. Yes, and yes falls in love with Jesus Christ, kicks the bottle habit, you know, and was still a rascal, still imperfect. <laughs> but what I saw was my grandpa sitting on the front porch and he's had a terrible childhood and he's still alive to tell about it and talk about how God has been faithful to him. Amen. No education, pa past third grade, couldn't, had to teach himself to read and write. Third grade was just, yeah, that really <laughs> wasn't accurate. It was, it was less than that. Um, but what I saw was overcomer. Mm -hmm. I didn't see all those problems. I saw overcomer. And, and of all the men in my life, one of the, the few that didn't walk out and because he knew God never walked down on him. Right, and right. That, that's what I take from his life, not all those imperfections. Right. Uh, one last little uh, lesson I kind of picked up in reading this, studying this, this lesson this week was when I was thinking about the wrestling. You know, there, there's many ways you can look at that wrestling with, with God and such. But it's interesting it mentions it as an angel, you know, it, it, as some uh, ways it says angel. And angels, we know, is also means like messenger. messenger. yeah. And messenger is messenger from God. It gives God's word. The Bible gives God's word too. And so I was thinking the fact that this story is also kind of a way of seeing the fact that if you're struggling with God through his word yeah. and not understanding and it feels well like, said. you know, you're just almost like God's word is attacking you because that's kind of how it started out for Jacob is this guy, this man, you know, <laughs> kind 
comes and it seems to attack him. He probably maybe thought it was even his brother was there at first or something. It's well, possible, there, yeah, you know? there was a lot of fear, so who knows what he you know. Thought. But as he went along, I'm sure he's going, well, this guy's, <laughs> I'm yeah. not taking him down. There's some issue here, yeah, you know, it's just, God. Yeah. But still, at the same time, we do that with, with the Word of God. Sometimes when we read it, it just seems like it's attacking us or it's just not making sense. And a lot of people will actually just give up. Oh, They'll yeah. stop. And yet, what does Jacob do here? He wrestles with those things. He doesn't give up on it because he knows there's still more to it, and he knows there's a blessing to be had there. That's right. And so he doesn't just take it, oh, I'll never figure this out. I'll give up. He hangs on and, until it makes him get the blessing. Yeah. And, and so I think that's important to think about. And, and so if, if you're here and you're, you have a part of Scripture you don't quite understand or something in your life doesn't quite make sense or adds up to the, mm-hmm, you know, in mm-hmm. terms of the character of God, well, if God's like this, how come this happen. I'm telling you, some of those places, if we don't tantrum the rest of our lives, meaning <laughs> just fold our arms and, yeah, this is not fair, because some of us could stay in that, those terrible twos forever if we want. <laughs> but if we're open yes. to the Spirit of God teaching us, some of those, I struggled forever with the concept of uh, eternal hell and, you know, we as Adventists do not belong, believe in the eternal suffering of the damned um, or those who reject Christ's mercy. Um, and I wrestled with Scripture and so forth. Mm-hmm. And once I compared Scripture with Scripture, in one moment I just wasn't thinking about it. I was sitting in class in the Philippines, and it hit me. It just <laughs> wasn't even something the professor said. It just hit me, all my studying, all my listening. And that became one of the deepest truths to me, to understand a God of mercy who also doesn't force people to spend eternity with him. And it became one of the deepest truths of right, mine. Right. So when, now it became my thing when somebody says God's not fair. I'm not all offended at getting in their face, <laughs> but deep down I know how God, how fair God has been to me. I look, through scripture, I look through Scripture differently and I say, wow, God is really much more fair and generous than we realize. But he leaves the Bible as it is, doesn't try to sugarcoat it or make it a fairy tale for our consumption. And those things that we wrestle with him through and the spirit leads us to deeper truth actually become those treasures that, that stay yes. with us on a deeper level and the blessing. Yes, amen. Let's move on to Monday here. We're running out of oh, time. Oh, so yeah. I've been a little long-winded here. Oh, that's okay. I have to. It's, got, it's such a, a good uh, lesson. Janice is going to come in here and keep us on track here in a <laughs> second. All right. So Monday, the brothers meet. And uh, it's... You know, it's quite a story. Go ahead and uh, look it up and read it. It's interesting. Okay. Uh, we won't have time to read it all ourselves here, but yes, uh, it, it's quite fascinating how <laughs> his fear and, and the planning he puts in. He really does some thinking on this. You know, he yeah. lines up. He's got two different camps, and then he splits up his family. Although it <laughs> kind of is interesting that he puts his one wife's family ahead of the, no, the other. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Odd. <laughs> a lot of oddities. But then again, he puts his. Uh, can you, can you hear wives, me okay? Wives above that, so. You can hear me okay? All right. But anyway, it's just interesting all these things that happen. But I do want to read this one part of the lesson here. I'm going to put it up if I can find okay. it. And, uh, and then we'll really have to motor. Yeah, just if, a you, long-winded if you can read this part real quick, this paragraph. Okay. Jacob bows himself seven times before his brother, Genesis 33, 3, whom he calls several times my Lord, Genesis 33, 8, 13, 15, uh, and with whom he identifies himself as his servant compared with, or that's in Genesis 33, 5, compared with Genesis 32, 4, 18, 20. Significantly, Jacob's seven bows echo his father's seven blessings, Genesis 27, 27 to 29. Furthermore, when he bows, he specifically reverses his father's blessing about nations bowing down to you, Genesis 27, 29. I thought it was uh, kind of interesting, interesting, the comparison there. Of... Yeah, very, very interesting indeed. And uh, there's a lot of grace there. And I love how, you know, he, he's not, of course, not call, calling him Lord with a capital L. Right. Um, but uh, here's a man of tremendous courage. He's just wrestled God, got a new name, prevailed against God, and still humbled enough to say, you know what? Uh, I need to do this uh, to, for my brother and to, before my brother. Um, and I, I wanted to ask the question down there at the bottom before we move on. Oh, okay, sure, I'll and put that And that is up. just this, just to, as a question to reflect upon, because we've all needed it from others. We could say, oh, I just need grace from God. Mm-hmm. How many times, it, we know God's mercies, but how many times have we really messed up with somebody else, and we just really need them to say, 
it's okay, or I forgive you. How, what have you learned about grace from how others besides the Lord have forgiven you? I just really want you to reflect on that. I'm going to take today to reflect on it. Those times where I was like, I, it's one thing when you mess up with the Lord, but I really screwed up with this human being. And humans, I, we know they're limited. And they're <laughs> oh, yeah. busy, and they're tired, and they're frazzled. We hurt one of them. Uh, there's just something extra when we get grace from them that reminds us you know, God doesn't have to be gracious with us, and He is, mm-hmm, because we remember mm-hmm. humans don't have to be gracious with us, and there, there are times when they are. And hopefully, in our society, we learn to be more and more gracious with each other. Now, I wanted to mention that also it talks about the fact that when Jacob meets uh, Esau, he says in Genesis uh, 33.10, I have seen your face as though I have seen the face of God. Now, this isn't meaning that he's seeing his brother as God. Mm-hmm. It's instead uh, talking about the idea that his, he's remembering the experience he had in seeing God and forgiving him and blessing him yep. just earlier in that night and then coming and seeing this and realizing what he needs to do is see the, his brother just like God sees his, his brother and yep. that is seeing the face of God in that person. You know, when, how often do we see people and someone looks a little different from us that we don't like, you know, looks a little off and we're just like, oh, I just can't like them. You know, just because their outside does things that makes us maybe not like them very much, on the inside, they're still created by God. They still right. have God in them that way, and we need to respect them and honor them the same way. Yeah. And, uh, and there, there's a huge correlation between like and love. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and, and oftentimes, God in his mercy will, will help us find something we like about somebody, because mm-hmm, it's hard mm-hmm. to say, I love somebody. I just don't like anything about them. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> Uh, the violation of Dinah, Tuesday, May 31st, um, that was one that it just was one that I didn't want to spend too much time on, but you're, you're the, just the one lead quick, on it. Just one quick section One quick with point that. I yeah. wanted you to, to, to touch but, on. Really quick before I get to that, though, I did want to make one other uh, interesting uh, comparison in reading the lesson. I realized that uh, grace and blessing are kind of talked about. They're, they're connected. But I was noticing grace is sort of like the promise of getting what we can't do for ourselves. You know, it's yes. that... But blessings are sort of like the gift or the manifestation of that grace being applied to our life. You know, when people think of blessings, sometimes they think it's all about getting a really good thing, you know, like getting a a car or something that you need or your life being saved. But a blessing can come in in hardship and punishment too. And it's all because of that grace though. That grace is what allows that to happen because God says he loves you and wants the best for you. He is going to do both the things that are good and bad, whatever is needed to end you with the blessing that is I would bringing yeah, you out. And, 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 and oftentimes, most oftentimes, take the things that are bad and turn them into good. In, the, Jacob's, the case, there always, is, yes. in Jacob's case, there is actually an injury there, but it's an injury that to the, the place that, uh, where he will be the father of a whole mm-hmm, nation, mm-hmm. you know. So, yeah, that's very well said. I do like the question at the end of May 31st. It's just an intense, deep story that time's not going to uh, allow us to dive too deeply on. Um, and there was some wording in the lesson about uh, somebody violating a woman but still caring for them. It just was, it got a little like, we got to be very careful with our language on things like that. Um, not as a, as a thought or word police but in a, a reality, a reality right, check. Right, right. Um, but I do like the question at the very end there. Again and again, if we could pull that up, uh, yeah, let me if you that. can. Again and again, we see deceit and deception. I want to read that all together. All right, if we can. Again and again, we see deceit and deception, as well as acts of kindness and grace in these accounts. What does this tell us about human nature? What I would say, mm-hmm. the darkness of human nature. But I want to say this too, and uh, the kindness and grace too. What does that tell us about the nature of God? Being mm-hmm. able to overcome those deceitful and manipulative aspects. So just a, just a question to live into or reflect into this Sabbath. Right. All right. And uh, I just wanted to do that real, uh, real quick thing on that also. That story, uh, obviously, again, very... Very hard to read in yeah. some ways, you know. Yeah. Uh, but there was one part of it necessary, I found... Necessary, but yes. challenging and hard to do justice to in a couple minutes. <laughs> but there was one part I just uh, wanted to bring out, and that is when I was reading uh, the verses in the, the beginning of the lesson where it says, you know, the different things to read for this week, one of them was, uh, I believe, Jeremiah 30, verses 5 through 7. 
and I won't take the time to read that, but basically it describes things saying that uh, can a male give birth and um, that God is seeing these people that are, these men that are of dread and horror on their face and they're grabbing their hands at their loins like a woman in childbirth mm. and their faces turn pale. And as I'm reading that, I realize that kind of matches this story of what those brothers did. Oh, and awesome. yet this verse at the end of Jeremiah says, but he will be saved from it. That mm -hmm. during this time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. And yet, if in the story, those sons don't do that. They take and pervert God's blessing and yeah. salvation and the spiritual importance of circumcision, and they use it to destroy these people yeah. that are trying to actually feel like they want to convert their life. Yeah. And so I want us to always remember that it's important that we don't use God... Yes. That's right. For our own benefit. That's true. That's true. As a shield for our own vengeance and ways of doing things. Exactly. Yeah. And then, so we move into prevailing idolatry. Um, we do want to move here. We're, we're getting close to that 1025 mark where we'll get the five minute uh, heads up. <laughs> and uh, that is so we can have a, a good setup for our, our 11 a.m. worship hour, which we invite you to uh, join us, everyone in here. Um, so if you want to just summarize some of this lesson, or if I can, if you want a little bit. but Yeah, s summarize Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah, the prevailing I idolatry. Um, uh, one of the things I just wanted to touch on was how oftentimes idolatry, we think it's, oh, I'm worshiping another god. I often think for us and for Israel, mm -hmm. um, I mean, by the time Jesus comes, a lot of the religious leaders, their idolatry was that they had turned God into their image. Um, instead, you know, they're not worshiping, you know, cat, golden calves and this and that per se, but they're turning God into their image. And when Jesus comes along, they're not quite ready, you know, mm -hmm. at all. <laughs> not quite is a nice way to put it. They're not ready at all. And so um, that's where I think we fall into idolatry is we have a picture of God and it has to be that way. And uh, so we can look at the Old Testament, all oh, those silly people and all their gods and all their golden calves. <laughs> yes, but yes. ours is a more sophisticated but, and, and it's more subtle, which I think is often more dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, it was interesting that in the story, uh, once this happens, obviously they're, <laughs> Jacob's fearing for his life. And his response is kind of interesting to some of these things. He's yes. more worried about his own life than, yeah. than some of the other things that actually happen. So. <laughs> <laughs> And that's for another time. But anyway, it, it does talk about the fact that God comes to him again. Look, at he does something horrible. His sons do something horrible. And yet God comes to him and he's like, I'll save you from this too if you yep. just you know, follow what I say. And one of the things is get rid of those idols you just took yep. and gathered from yep. the, the town that you just destroyed. Right. You know? And what do they do with it though? It's kind of interesting. They take all those and they bury it at the foot of a tree under interesting. that. And all I could think of is isn't that what we kind of need to do with our idols in our life? Is if you want to get rid of them, it's not, not enough to just kind of set them off to the side somewhere. Take them to the feet of Jesus at the cross. Amen. Put them at the bottom of that tree and let him help you with it. Yep. And then move on from there. That's right. That's right. The only true hope of uh, recovery for something like that. All right. Uh, June 2nd, Thursday, touches on the death of Rachel. And I think we're going to be winding down here pretty um, pretty uh, soon here. Um, but again, I want to read the last point that I thought was so brilliant. If there's anything else you want to touch on, you can. But the last point on Thursday, a reflective question that I just thought was brilliant. Um, yeah, let me uh, pull it up. There it is. Error. And again, this to so ties into our study in um, uh, Legends of the Past. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was telling them, Janice, a little bit earlier that I'm going to be preaching on Jacob, I think, as maybe the last sermon in the Old Testament. I'm not going in order throughout any of them, but I think he, I'm going to save him for last now that we've studied this. So it's going to be a little while, I think, before we hear uh, too much from Jacob in our sermon study, um, sermon series. The death of Rachel, I want to read this, uh, this question or this reflection. Despite human error, God's ultimate purposes will be fulfilled. Amen. You know, I wrote... The, the, I wrote the thing before I read this. I wrote slide B in my sermon before I read this. And when I read it, I was like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. No, it's just the Holy Praise Spirit. The Spirit, just, you know, the Holy yep, Spirit yep, just brings yep. everything Amen. together. Despite human error, God's ultimate purposes will be fulfilled. Imagine what would happen if people cooperated, if they obeyed him. 
How much more easily that is with less human suffering and stress and delay could God's will then be accomplished? I want to say two things on this. The, the, the word obey, again, is, it, you know, Jacob just doesn't come along and say, uh, let go of me. Okay, we think that's obedience. No, obedience is, is that uh, listening under. Like, he knows that this is a more powerful being than him, than him but he's not going to let go until he receives a blessing. Mm -hmm. That's another form of obedience. We take obedience like, like my dog getting a biscuit. You know, do this or you don't get a biscuit. It's, it's, it's a lot more interactive than that. And number two, what I want to say is um, how much more easily, the question is, how much more easily that is with less human suffering and stress and delay, could God's will then be accomplished if we were in that space of obedience? And I just want to say the word easy. I thought about the word easy. Yeah. <laughs> God, Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And sometimes it's like, Boy, this thing feels awfully hard. But I thought about that this, this week. I think what makes it hard is that it's easy, it's actually easy to walk with God in terms of He makes it possible and life is better when we do it. Here's the challenge. It's also easy not to walk with God. <laughs> it's easy to forget Him. It's mm -hmm, easy to wake mm -hmm. up late. It's easy to once we start seeing His blessings to think, hey... You know, look at, look at, look at me, you know, like, I, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. You know, look at what I did, which is why I love the story of Joseph that we're going to talk about in a bit. And so it's easy to let God work with us when we uh, align with him, when we connect to the vine, as Jesus says, the challenge is it's easy not to do that too. Oh yeah. And, and, and so um, I love how they, how they just put it here, the teachers, that how much easier would it be? Think about all that God accomplished with the obstacles. Yes. Now think about how much easier, not just for God, but for us, if we just said, you know what, I'm, I'm going with the plan. However, even, we're going to read uh, Ellen White's statement here in a second, even then we're going to have times of trouble. Not oh, just yeah. the time of trouble. <laughs> we're going to have times of trouble. We're going to have little Jacob's situations here and there, mm -hmm. uh, as we'll see as we uh, look at Friday soon. So oh, yeah, I just wanted to, re to, to look at that as yes. we close on Thursday. Well, and I think this whole lesson is really about that, because yeah. uh, Jacob is a wonderful example of that. He started out in his faith, he seemed very, he, he believed God strongly. Yeah. So much so that he was willing to cheat and lie to get his, the blessing that he thought he was supposed to have. And all these things in his life started out horribly. He was a very dynamic man, to put it one way. And yet he had to come to the realization that it's, you know, it's good to follow God and have faith in God, but it's important to let God lead. Yes. You know, it's, it's not enough to just try to, to fight God's will and to make things happen. Yes. When it doesn't seem like God is doing what you want, you're like, well, I know better, so I'm going to make it happen. That's what he did so many times. Oh, yeah. And, and he let just, fear and get to him. And his mom taught him. Yeah. <laughs> the apple didn't fall that far for the tree. Yep. Mom, mom was in on it a little bit there. Yeah. And uh, um, I do, I, can we go to Friday? I want to read the quote, unless there's something uh, else yeah, you want to more, touch on. One, one more quick thing okay. I did read in the list I wanted to mention here, and that was kind of interesting, is it talks about, uh, you know, Rachel dying and also the birth yes. of uh, Benjamin. Uh, there was an interesting part where her handmaid, when this is happening, she's struggling in the childbirth. She dies in childbirth. And the handmaid says to her, uh, do not fear, you're having a boy, something like, it's a boy. Mm -hmm. And the, the phrase, do not fear, is also what God used to reassure Abraham. Yeah. You know, it's just amazing how these things all come together. And it's, uh, the, the, the son is linked to Bethlehem and yeah. the way it comes in there. And it's interesting that Rachel, when she's dying, she names her son, yep. Ben-Oni or something yep. like that, right? Which means son of my sorrow. Mm -hmm. But then uh, Jacob comes along, he's like, I'm changing that to son of, <laughs> son of the right the, hand. Son of the right hand. So the, the, uh, the name thing again, which what yes, you started with. Exactly. With it, it's amazing with. how it you know, fits into that. That's right. And it's interesting how that can apply to, to different things that way. You know, it's just God's promise of leading so let's right. go ahead and go ahead and look at Friday. That's the yeah, one. Yeah, I want to look. At, I want to look at the quote she has, but yes. I want to look at. I, not, we're not going to have time to read the whole thing. I want to read towards the end of it. So she's talking about um, Jacob's experience, the night of wrestling, and that the people of God, as we get closer to the end, are going to experience this, where the enemy is going to have many of us convinced that we're lost and think about all the bad things we've done. But I, I want to say this that. 
many people are going through that right now, like lesser mm -hmm. versions of that right mm -hmm. now. So these are all, I think, warm-ups, but um, just for everyone here, if you're going through a time of struggle or you're struggling with habits or addictions or negative ways of thinking, beating yourself up, beating other people up verbally, what are just looking at the world and saying there's no hope and all of these things, uh, there's something to learn from here. And what Amen. I want to what I want to do is um, start where it says Satan will endeavor. Um, so it says down there, Satan will endeavor. I, but I want us to think about the the in time of trouble, but I want to think of us to think about nights where we're wrestling. We have wrestling nights now, mm -hmm. you know, in these moments. Satan will endeavor to terrify them with the thought that their cases are hopeless, mm -hmm. that their sins have been too great to receive pardon. They will have a deep sense of their shortcomings, and as they view their lives, their hopes will sink. I love the word but. <laughs> yes. Remembering the greatness of God's mercy. Can you say Amen. And their own sincere repentance, they will plead his promises made through Christ to helpless, repenting sinners. Mm -hmm. That just means people who are outcast, who are ready to say, I'm, I want to do it a different way. I want to head in a different direction. So we take it out of the, the, the vocabulary, just Christianese, we understand. Helpless, right. repenting sinners means people who are outcasts, outsiders, who say, I want to do differently. And it's yeah, go ahead. It's important to remember that these are promises. Yep. And promises don't necessarily mean that they're going to happen instantly the moment you claim them. Instantaneously. Either. That's it, right. It, it's grace and it's the end result. And so this is important that when you're doing these things that you realize, you know, these promises are assured. They're just not necessarily assured at the, the exact moment well, you think actually, they're going to happen. Actually, I'll say this. <laughs> they actually do happen right now. Well, yeah. It, the, it, the thing it, is, the feelings don't come. Right. The feeling, we, we go by, it, it's not true unless I feel it. And right. no, the, the no, wave no, no. of feeling, <laughs> it has nothing to do with what God is doing. Um, right. it, but the wave of feeling often comes uh, with that assurance. Even Jacob needed it. We need it. We are right. humans. Well, that was one of his biggest promises. He started right. out with this idea... God isn't doing enough. I don't right. feel like he's doing enough <laughs> to get right. me what I need, so I better do it. That's right. So I'm going to keep on reading here. Yes. Their faith will not fail because their prayers, which you said, are not immediately answered. They will lay hold of the strength of God. Yes. As Jacob laid hold of the angel, and the language of their souls will be, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. So there's a decision for us mm -hmm. to be involved there. Now let's finish off with yet Jacob's history. So we might be going to 37 here, uh, 1037. Yet Jacob's history is an assurance that God will not cast off. Listen, everyone. God will not cast off those who have been betrayed into sin, but who have returned unto him with true repentance. It was by self-surrender and confiding faith that Jacob gained what he had failed to gain by conflict in his own strength. God thus taught his servant that divine power and grace alone could give him the blessing he yes. craved. Let me read that again. Yes. Uh, God thus taught his servant that divine power and grace alone could give him the blessing he craved. Thus it will be those who live in the last days. As danger surround them and despair seizes upon the soul, they must depend solely upon the merits of the atonement. We can do nothing of ourselves. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Praise the Lord. It's on God's shoulders. If you yes. have a burden this week, if you have a struggle this week, put it on God's shoulders and be ready to decide. Regardless of how you feel, you're going to believe Him and then act and live your life as if you believe Him. Yes. That's it. You act and you live your life as if you believe Him and watch the ways that God shows up. Amen. It is not our power. It is God's power. But He never takes away the power for us to decide and to trust in Him. Amen. Amen. So my brother, uh, we're all fired up, ready for the 11 <laughs> o'clock hour. Amen. We're short-staffed. I'm praying for Brother uh, Richard Castle, who went into the ER last night with a exceedingly high blood pressure, exceedingly high heart rate. I'm pleased to let you know he is home. He is safe. Mm -hmm. uh, we are praying for Richard. And uh, Richard, if you're watching, we're praying for you. And uh, we look forward to having you back when you are healthy. But this is the Sabbath. So do what God tells you to do, my brother. Rest. 
We'll take care of it from here. We'll find an elder for the platform, and <laughs> Kyle will change the slides. Um, the, uh, the other brother I want to pray for is Smith. Uh, mm -hmm. less severe I think but uh, graduated Thursday in Angel Stadium no better place to graduate I don't think um, and I accidentally drove past it so I think I saw you Smith in the parking lot but he came down ill it looks like the flu potentially so we are praying for Smith as well God bless our brothers God bless Tina and her family hopefully they're feeling better they had some cases of COVID but it looks like they're all mm -hmm. past that have tested negatively lately mm -hmm. so uh, thank you all for joining us here I'm going to ask Kyle to pray and then I will give one more invitation for the uh, 11 o'clock hour our gracious Father, uh, your name is above all names. You do so much for us. Your grace abounds, and we just need to rely on your promises, and yet, oh, how we struggle. Amen. We fight it so much. We think we know better somehow. We, we give in to the fears and the temptations. And so we just ask that you would help us to remember your name. Amen. Remember that the things in life that are coming on us are not going to overwhelm us because you have written everything. All the words in this world, all the names in this world are under your control. There's nothing that is not in your control and that our lives are assured if we just continue to wrestle with you, to just hang on to you until we receive that blessing that you have promised us. It's already been guaranteed. Amen. And so we just ask for your help to be able to remain faithful to you in our, in our strength and trusting your promises. And I just ask that you would help us to have a wonderful Sabbath and be with those that are struggling with the different things going on in life and just uh, give them the hope that comes from your promises. Thank you, Lord. Uh, just bless us this Sabbath. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So in the first Sabbath of uh, celebrating grads and dads, uh, we want to say uh, our prayer for you all is that we graduate in our... Uh, trust in God from mm -hmm. glory to glory, from strength to strength, even if it's just an inch. Uh, and it's not about us, it's about Him. And uh, there's no better, no matter what kind of dad you had on this planet, great dad, imperfect dad, um, a dad you can never live up to, or a dad who <laughs> walked out on you. You have a heavenly dad, a Amen. heavenly father who loves you beyond measure and has done everything and is doing everything to work life out on your behalf. And our invitation is to trust in that. It is Amen. June 4th, 2022 again. So my brothers and sisters, you'll never get another one of those again. Live this Sabbath up to the fullest. Enjoy all the blessings of God. If you are on your way or you're not on your way yet, join us at 11 a.m. for our worship service. We have potluck at 1 o'clock. It's, it's not a huge feast of the most luxurious food, but is the most luxurious fellowship with the people of God you could ever experience. Amen. Amen. So join us there. God bless you. We will see you at 11. Thank you, brother. God thank bless you. you. And thank you all. Thank you. And good morning, Ron Larson.